Hi lads, thanks for tuning into the podcast again. Don't forget to like and subscribe and head over to the Patreon to contribute and help us out. Thanks a million and enjoy the podcast. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tonari's podcast. I'm your host James and I'm joined by my good friend Timmy Lang. Hi everyone. Rowan is on the deck. Say hi Rowan. Hi Rowan. What about Rowan's haircut though? <laughs> that is what you call a lovely idea. Maybe we're waiting at the weekend. <laughs> yeah, but uh, on the ball run. We have the two boys from the Recovery Academy, Mark Wright, who is the coordinator of the Recovery Academy in Cork, and Paul Duff is the coordinator of the Recovery Academy in Dublin. I'll come to you first, Paul, Yeah. because you've been the longest around. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what the Recovery Academy is? Yeah, um, so um, as you mentioned, I'm the coordinator, I'm national coordinator of Recovery Academy of Ireland, and it was an organisation that was set up in 2017. Now, it was, it was registered as a charity in 2017. It was launched in 2016. Um, and it was following on from a lot of work that was done voluntary from um, services and people coming together to look at what was taking place in regards to recovery within Ireland at that time. Because in England and other, in other parts of the world, like uh, America, there was a recovery movement happening and i suppose some of the services were looking to see what was happening within with respect to a recovery movement in ireland at that time um and so they they kind of identified that some of it was due to policy and how policy was written up national drug policy um and then some of it was what was happening on the ground in relation to service provision so they looked at how they could the academy could develop as as an organisation to promote and advocate for recovery services and the reorientation of recovery services as well. So the Recovery Academy in Dublin is a separate organisation. Um, it's a national organisation. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a separate identity from any other service. However, it does um require the the the, the collaboration with other services because again, it's a it's a service in its infancy. There's me. And there's Mark who are, who are, who are recruited to do some of the initiatives. We mm. rely on a lot of volunteer volunteers and stuff, you know. So yeah. So how did um how did it all come about for both of you? I'll go to you first. As in the yeah. organisation or rec- yourself? You're in recovery yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I am. So, so I'm I'm be twelve years in recovery. Um, well done. And recovery, well I suppose, well for me started with again. We all know the mm. the life that goes with it. Um, I came from similar backgrounds yourself, from areas of, of social disadvantage. I came from Fingless. Um, um, my parents done done their best as what mm. what they could. You know, yeah, yeah. I was heavily influenced by peers, um, and kind of went down, you could say, the wrong route. Or what mm. what I felt was, I, I don't know, was a level of norm- normality at that time. And mm. um, thankfully, that was. A number of years, as I said, twelve years ago. Thankfully, I'd met a, a counselor who directed me towards um, treatment and rehabilitation services and fellowship, and um, my life changed after that. When I, I suppose, seek the support of existing services and seek the support of of peers as well, because peers were instrumental within my recovery. You know. Yeah, it's the, that's a massive part of anybody's recovery is is finding people that are similar to yourself. It yeah. is So you don't feel alienated. You know, outside of the box, and when you go to the air or any of meetings or wherever, you're going to find somebody completely the same as yourself because they're talking about your story. Mm. Might be exactly the same, but a lot of it will be the same, and that's what keeps people in. And then it's about going for coffee. It's yeah. about going for meals when guys hit their month, yeah, when they yeah. hit their twelve months, their two years, their ten years. And that's what it's about. Mm. It's about mixing and finding people that think the same, isn't it? Yeah. 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 What about yourself, Mark? Uh, yeah, so I would have been the same. I come from the south side, man, and, um, and uh, would be classed as a disadvantaged area. The north um, side of the south side? Yeah, well, I've been living over the, south, uh, the north side now since I'm 17. Like, so well, I, I don't know where I come from <laughs> now at this stage. Um, but I would be, I would have been case managed from a young age. Like um, there would have been a lot of trauma within the household, a lot of addiction. Um, I'm in recovery with myself seven years. Um, mm-hmm. But it would have been without that support and that them two people that that supported me at the start and that never gave up me. The case managers. What's um, that like a key worker? Yeah, yeah, but it was different back in the day. What they were called was drugs workers. So I would have got into the guard of youth diversion projects, so over getting in trouble with the guards and cautions and stuff. So. 
um, that's why I got became involved with that drugs worker at the time. Mm. Like, and she, every time I went out and kept using or kept going back out there, like she would just be knocking on my mum's door or tell yeah. him come out, tell him come out. So it's that support and that bond and that relationship at the start, like. And mm. I suppose back then at the time you were saying, "Well, she ever yeah, wait yeah. and stop and I'm." But it's when you get into recovery, you can look back at those really positive and healthy mm. people that helped you. You know, even though you were taught, they were taught they were trying to annoy you. She was you at uh, she was at one of the pop up yeah. cafes two weeks ago, and she brought in pictures of me painting Martina. The, no, Teresa Clifford. Oh, Teresa, yeah. She brought in pictures of me and another fellow who was actually dead, no, from this from this illness, like um, uh, painting her house. Oh, I, yeah. was, I was only this in Bavog, like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It was cool, like. Yeah, my first like I met Mark in in uh, aftercare. Yeah. Seven year ago was it, Mark? Yeah. yeah. And um, Mark was yeah, in yeah, aftercare. Well. I was only after getting out of prison, and I, I continued my aftercare. Mm. And I was out of treatment about three years at this stage. But I, when I got out, I had nothing in place, so I decided to do my aftercare from the treatment because when I got out of treatment, I got it went straight to prison. Mm-hmm. You know, so my aftercare was three years down the road. <laughs> I'd say that's not common. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so I met him and fuck it, like I was seeing him there while I go on I was like looking at a completely different person, yeah. you know. Demeanor was different, you know, the anxiety was done, the, the big yeah. fear. I'm not as wired. No. He doesn't tuck his jeans into his socks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I wore these especially. <laughs> but it's brilliant. It's just brilliant seeing people. And, like, even when I asked you your age there, and you said you were 32, like, I have this thing seven years already. It's mm. amazing, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And was it always your was it always you first part was it always your ambition when you come into recovery to try and go back and help people like you um, were helped no, or did you fall into it? And it was kind of a chain of events. Um, interesting enough, um, it started like as I, I, I as I said I ended up in in treatment. It was a day program really that kind of um highlighted the importance of of education to me and it done it in a totally different system than i was used to when i was when i was younger a system that i basically didn't didn't conform to or didn't i, I just wasn't able to sit in the classroom and take it in that way Um, some of my own like i wouldn't say a adverse experience was with school mm. do you know that mm. way i know i was the very same a, a really traumatizing experience yeah so. yeah even down to i give it a prime example like I remember, I was in in um, in um, primary school, and we didn't. I, I wasn't one for sitting in the class and um, taking in the way that it was taught, you know. And I I was a bit of a, a messer in the class, so they put you in a cl- in a classroom doing pages with a group of people that were all there for messing. So you kind of learned how to mess. Mm-hmm. So you you upskilled in in acting the maggot, really. Mm-hmm. Do you know that way? And then when I went to secondary school, and not to say like yeah it's my I suppose my experience there was I, I thought I'd done well in my entry exam and when I went to school they put me in class 107 mm. and it was a system like that where I, 101 was the good the, yeah. that's how I felt yeah. and I was yeah. in 107 so I kind of and then they, it got worse then do you know where they made you go around with um, a, a, a piece of paper to make and every time you done something wrong or done something good you got marked and you had to bring it to the next class and that was mm. Like it was an That's awful ridiculous. system, you know. Yeah, I know. And then ridiculous. so, and like thankfully there was I, my family, my dad and all had, had, I suppose instilled certain values and 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 stuff into me. And my dad always said, "Get your junior cert." Um, it's mm. very working class background. Get your junior cert and get an apprenticeship. Yeah. And I tried that, and uh, I wasn't. I I got as far as I wasn't that successful in it. As in, I suppose from the skill and stuff, it was the levels of low self-esteem and in mm. and, and lack of confidence because no i felt wonder. yeah yeah, yeah no. exactly yeah so and i didn't i didn't learn about that until i came into a, a day program and realized well this is this is why you've done the things that you've done and i was able to address them within that day program and then they showed me a way through adult education of how i could educate myself and the importance of educating myself to be come to get out of that level of poverty or or um disadvantage that i i, I was we're in, do you know yeah. that way? Can so, you, um, tell the people watching and listening that don't know what a day program is. So, a day program is very much a, 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 a service that delivers. Um, it could be therapeutic interventions. It could be groups where you talk about what's going on for you. 
um, at any given day. It might be looking at what had gone in the on in the past, um, seeing was there any trauma or anything. For me, I don't feel it was trauma. If maybe if I done an ACEs scale, I'd probably hit a four or a six, which yeah. you know. Um, but within that day program, there was a big um, the importance of education was instilled where you start on. I, I think I heard you speaking before on one of the podcasts about starting at level three mm. and moving your way up. That was me, And yeah. that, was, that was how it was for me. And, and I seen that it was a way out of, of, of educating myself. And I suppose to go back to your question that you asked was that, that I find, I kind of went into education and I went into do a level five and it was a placement on the level five. And... Um, at the time, I had a, a very minimal charge. It was a, it was a driving offence at the time, and um, because it was outstanding, I couldn't get a placement. And thankfully, a friend of mine who was in recovery had done a placement with Lynn Rowan in a in a service that she was in. We know and, Lynn well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and she's done a lot for the to bend convictions. Yeah, that's and right. that was at that time. That's probably what I needed was them minimal convictions yeah. to be spent, so I could actually. So I kind of. I didn't want to get into addiction services at the time because I was like, oh, I'm out of coming from that. I know mm. what, you know. But then my opportunity arose to go into a service and I learned what it was like to be on the other side. And that's where the journey began for me. Mm. That's where I realised I wanted to be in, supporting and helping and looking at addiction, yeah. you know. Both just, yourself, Matt, how did you get roped into doing that role? Do you know what? <laughs> I was like, I stood up from a child, a young child. I mean, I was small, I was skinny, I was foxy. I was diagnosed <laughs> with all sorts, so like I was always kind of the black sheep as such. You know what I mean? Mm. And there would have been bullying. The dad wouldn't have been on the scene in and out of institutions and stuff like that. Mm. So that I can go back to case management again. Like that case, the the case man, manager that took um, an interest in me and was guiding me along the road. Like never gave up on me. She always there was two. There was Mary Carroll and Teresa Clifford. Like I was went into Tabor. I would. Uh, I was a prime candidate for the pilot program of case management because I presented to the residential with multiple needs. Like, um, oh yeah, on that, right? Can you define case management for the people that don't know what it is? Case management, a case manager, or case management. What? So a case manager would be the person that a key worker would go to with with the with the clients um, and the case management would be an overarching framework of support bringing in an interagency collaboration piece so the homeless the mental health the addiction services all coming together to support the client to get the best care possible remember that now for your next big interview <laughs> Joe Corby no big fucking but in a nutshell case management is key working not just for addiction no. or the drug use a case manager key work somebody in whatever area of their life that it's they need attention. A framework to it bring in all housing, health, exactly. education, yeah. employment. The addiction whole might be part of it, but a case manager is like a general key worker. Yeah, really. Yeah. So go on. So that that, that and you mentioned mentioned Joe. Like so, Joe back in the day was the one that was setting up the pilot program. So I got the case manager, and she stuck with me. Went out, came back, went out, came back. And no matter what, I could always pick up the phone to her saying, look, I need to go into the relapse prevention. I need to go back into aftercare. I need to go back into residential. And she was always there, like, do you know what I mean? Never gave up. So I suppose through that, um, I went to further my education, started a diploma in UCC, through Fo- Focus Ireland supporting me with that, mm. uh, and then done the degree. But I had to do placement then for the degree. So it was my c- old case manager that taught me about King Vara House, um, Joe Corby. Mm. She said, go up and ask him and tell him that you've done the pilot program, program for case management and see what he says will he take on in placement. I didn't know at the time that he was after setting it up and that I was one of the first people to do it and now I'm going up asking him to do placement. So I went up anyway and I met with Owen Co- Coughlin and Joe Corby and I got placement up there then like. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what do you want to do? I said, I just want to support people the way that I was supported yeah. through the case management procedure. And sure, he was after clicking then like who I was. So it was just class how it turned around of like yeah. I was the first pilot program and, and then you come back. full circle yeah. in a sharp period of time. Yeah. That, yeah. Happens, that happens a lot actually with people in recovery like yeah. they actually become the person that had actually helped them at the beginning of their own journey doesn't it? Yeah it is yeah there's a criminologist there a very f- famous criminologist in, in that field like 
uh, Dr. Shad Maruna. He's uh, from Chicago, but he's based in Queens and Belfast. But he writes about... Um, he, he researches desistance, which is basically abstinence from mm. offending behaviour. So it's like recovery for people that commit crime. Yeah, yeah. It goes hand in hand recovery. If you get your recovery in check, the desistance happens mm. because we don't commit crime when we're in recovery. Yeah. Crime is a by Anyway, I'm gone off in a. <laughs> but he talks about people that have come through crime um, and that are desisting now, are in recovery from crime, becoming the wounded healer. Mm. They they go back into the service and they feel an obligation to help the other person. It's a way to make amends. Mm. It's mm. a way to build back up the self esteem. It's a way to right some of the wrongs that we've mm. committed. So it's kind of like that, you yeah, know. Yeah, people yeah. in recovery. But there's no better person to know what that person needs then as well. Yeah, mm. someone that because they have to go through it themselves, you know. So it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's mad like yeah that's after doing full 360 like and mm. I try and support people now like I very rarely say no if someone needs something mm. I go above and beyond probably with one of us score there so I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what's your role today what, what, tell me a little bit about the Recovery Academy in Cork so the Recovery Academy Cork is a branch of the Recovery um, Academy Ireland um, so it originally came down Joe Kirby was in talks with Paul and Paul was telling him about it the, the initiatives that they were being set up in Dublin and I was doing placement at the time and I was like look that sounds very interesting I'll take my hand to it um, done it for a while loved it so what I do basically is I challenge stigma and I advocate on behalf of people I set up um, initiatives um, to highlight uh, addiction or recovery within the community mm-hmm. um, and basically I try and, and support people where they're at and send pe- try to support people getting into education and anything I can take my hand to anything really like do you take referrals from agencies or do you take self referrals I mean, I do both. <laughs> so somebody can ring you up in the morning, say, Mark, I'm in recovery, I'm in addiction, I'm yep. looking to get involved. That can be done. I do a lot of signposting. Um, so what my piece is, is trying to, I'm trying to bring services together to communicate. And if I have someone that's looking for a residential and they're coming from a homeless accommodation, I can do that as well, mm. do you know? Or uh, signposting to a group or to soccer that we've gone on a Monday. Or I try to set up fun activities, mm. pro-social events for people that are in recovery because we've been in doom and gloom and the negativity for so long I want to bring the fun aspect of things like is there yeah. funding there for that then and you have to ask Joe Corby but <laughs> there, yeah. there isn't at the moment but he very rarely says no um, next time you're going go karting in the rain give well, me a show I was actually <laughs> pricing it the other day for the kids party it's saucy enough like. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, do you want to what, tell us a little bit about that soccer you've gone I have soccer for work, so recovery month of September, and it's a big part of why we're here is to is to spread the message that recover and make recovery visible within the community. Yeah. So I got a game of ball going up in St Vincent's GAA club on a Monday night. Now the mm-hmm. last the last uh, night of it is next Monday, um, but I'm hoping to carry it forward. Just depends on St Vincent's being um, nice enough to allocate the time. Like. Yeah. Um, but it's at six o'clock to seven o'clock for anyone that wants to come. We have people coming from homeless accommodation, from mental health services, for addiction, from in recovery. So it's all inclusive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, Thomas Gould is the Thomas chairman of yeah. the club above, but he's Sinn Féin sport person and drugs, drugs and yeah, recovery and stuff. He actually got me the he approved pitch for free for the four weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. But um, he's coming on the podcast next week. Nice one. Um, so we could talk to him about that. What about yourself, Paul? Any anything happening about yeah, in so, Dublin? Yeah. Um, so. As, as, as Mark mentioned, we are an advocacy service mainly that works to promote and look at recovery initiatives in line with the National Drug Strategy and um, the support and recovery element of it. So there's been a lot of services in, in, involved in doing things themselves at a local level. Um, usually the, the academy runs a, a, an annual walk um, which brings services together and goes through the, the main tour affair of Dublin. But unfortunately, COVID, we couldn't do that. So we've asked services to look at local initiatives and there's a lot happening as, as Mark mentioned football and um, people going out and walks doing virtual cycles and mm. just a lot of coming together um, it, and we're trying to build on a year on year and um, we've also um, with with the annual walk which is our it would have been the biggest thing for re, re, with regards to um, making recovery visible and challenging that stigma we now have a leave a light on campaign which is taking place on the 30th of September mm. that will look at we've um, prominent buildings um, across Ireland um, 
lighting up on on the, the 30th yeah. of September to in in a sign of solidarity for mm, for the yeah, whole recovery yeah. mov- movement and to show that recovery is possible and mm. again challenge the stigma as Mark Mark yeah. mentioned you know so on year on year I I've been employed since 2018 since then we're trying to I've been targeting task force areas like Cork and Kerry to to look um uh, how we could maybe collaborate and bring mm. services, existing services together to see what recovery initiatives can be done um, across Ireland. And, and that continues to be the goal, you yeah, know. It's yeah. a fantastic idea. It really, really op- it, It's going to open up a lot more doors, you know, when all the, the different agencies come together and they start creating. Say, for instance, we have the, the mini marathons down here, yeah. you know. Maybe in a few years' time we could have a recovery marathon once twice a year we might start off with a few hundred people that could turn out to five six seven thousand people in in a few years and look look at the awareness that's mm. creating then around the city and i think what what you're actually doing is is amazing yeah right? and so. that's that's evident in like the academy is only um as i said a registered charity since 2017 and the launch was 2016 but there was a the, the walk was was something that was set up in 2011 and um, Barry Coslow actually had, had was involved with that and a number of other different services were in Dublin and there was probably a handful of people at the force one and um, I remember being at the one in 2012 or something and there was we, I think we could walk on the path to another yeah. to another kind of way so and then within the 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 year on year it was kind of um it was on the outskirts of, of Dublin and then for the last two years that it was that it was hosted, it was through the main thoroughfare with eight or seven or eight hundred people and you know we had a big event so to, to, to say like there's we could easily do a marathon I think mm-hmm, if you yeah. start build on a year on year and that's brings together um services and people in recovery. It diminishes the stigma and, and, and I've seen that even with the two years that the walk went down um O'Connell Street because the first year I think was it two thousand was it two thousand and eighteen um and it was real because it was it was O'Connell Street and everyone I well I felt it was my observation let's say that people were a little oh who's gonna see me type of thing you know or yeah. where like I'm I probably felt a little of that myself yeah. and then the year after that was a real celebration it was a lovely warm day people out loud and proud they were wearing purple they were it's like I'm in recovery mm. do you know it yeah. felt that there was a there was a, a lot a lot less steam or uh, uh, stigma even experience you know and that's that's what it's about because evidence shows that that stigma is a huge barrier for people seeking support and and, and seeking the help that they need in some cases you know it is starting to change though that stigma is starting to shift like i remember years ago you daren't hear somebody say they were an alcoholic openly yeah. it's just it, it is what it is no and no, we're, we're trying to celebrate it yeah. we're trying mm. to normalize it like yeah. there i have programs running there now i have partnerships with the Mardik, the hse um Kumain. we have an activity recovery program going in the Mardik. there's 30 people there's 15 on the waiting list they have a full membership to the Mardik. And no one knows they're in recovery in there. Mm. It's just normalised. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but no one knows that it's the activity know, recovery really program in there. Do you know what I mean? I know, yeah. And does, do they give that to you then for free? No, so they, play, they pay a minimum. The, the participants pay a contribution mm. and the HSE have funded the rest of that. Um, play, that's, that's, that's actually it, it's, fair play. It's, it's huge, but the mm. evidence behind it, so the, it's up for renew now again in December and the coordinator in the Mardyk, um, who is also the personal trainer, you get a personal training session if you need weekly checks and mm. check-ins by myself we'll support you with that we do team building events we couldn't do it now um, last year over covid mm. so we're hoping that if we get the funding again in december that we'll roll out afresh more people um with kumoin being on board in as well there's a physical activity program starting in mayfield sports complex mm. cork city sports partnership have agreed to fund that with a minimum contribution from the participants so there's all that stuff that's normalizing this in, in the community i'm trying to set up one um, in each um, district, do you know what I mean? Um, so I'm looking at Churchville, maybe. I um, so what might be cool to get going, maybe regionally or in, in regionally and then maybe overall, like a recovery forum or something. Like, do you know where you bring in, you bring in, let's say in Cork, you bring in the Tabor Group, the Cool Mines, Churchville yeah. Trust, Cork Alliance, Simon, Vincent de Paul, and a kind of like a, maybe a quarterly meeting where we kind of collaborate, come together. 
and come up with stuff as a collective, you know. Yeah. I did a talk there recently, not recently, but maybe a couple of months ago now, you know, Canal Communities Task Force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I give a talk, there's um, Service Users Forum. So I give a talk for them, right? But it wasn't just one organisation. It was any organisation yeah. within Dublin East and surrounds could come. But I thought, like, it'd be great if they had that sort of collaboration yeah, down yeah. there too. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I think you could be the missing link, do you know what I mean? Because your recovery academy, your Yeah, recovery. yeah, and that's that's something we, I, I had to... Um, I, you were on one of them presentations, yeah, actually, yeah. to, to Bally Pharma <coughs> and Talent Drug Task Force explaining the work of the academy, and that's, uh, again, getting the message out, and even the academy was set up as a forum, and that's how it, I suppose, evolved into a national organisation. So, yeah. yeah, it's a great idea to be done at local level. Do you know, know the way some of the fellowships, they do, like... Um, <coughs> Not the retreats, but what are they called? The conventions. conventions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recovery yeah. Academy convention. That'd be some crack, wouldn't it? Do you know what? No, it was like, I was so excited two years ago. Before it was launched in the City mm. Hall with the face of recovery. And I think we were doing an official Cork launch, like three, four weeks after that. But then we had the venue booked, the band was booked, the food was booked. It was on a Thursday and we got shut down, locked down on the Wednesday. So mm. we didn't actually get to launch. So I was pushed onto like social media and trying to build the platform mm. yeah. without having without the capabilities of going out to tell people about it. So it's it's trying to it's only in its early days since we're kind of yeah. out of lockdown. But hundred percent, I totally love to go out to the recovery academy. Hundred percent, you know, like yeah, get Will I wait down to do a show? <laughs> or Timmy might do a strip yeah. or something for the old eyes. <laughs> 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 but you, you read my mind, it, yeah. <laughs> I think it is. But you get fair spy in from people. We've yeah. had a lot of people on the podcast that are in recovery, that are in that are entertainers, mm. they're involved in singing and acting. Yeah. They, and we've mentioned something like this. We we floor, we floated the idea of maybe a recovery festival. And we've had a few people on yeah. the whole bands or they're all in recovery yeah, yeah. and they'd and love to do anything like that. Mm. And something similar, that's what's been happening in Ballymoan with they've had a, a month of events over the the month of September. Um Finglas has done a um, a month of a calendar of events as well. So it's happening at a local level there. It's just it's the more people see mm. what could be done, um, the more opportunity for it to be done, you know. Yeah. But it means a lot more. Like it means a lot more than just recovery. It means people really overcome their their trauma and their mental health yeah. issues. It's not just about being abstinent from alcohol and drugs. It's about growing as human beings as well mm. and 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 change like as i said to you earlier like the difference i see in you that's recovery yeah you know recovery to me is somebody really facing those demons that they drank on and drugged on or whatever and dealing with services like the services that you're providing james is providing like and counselors and psychotherapists and all mm. these there is the recovery aspect you know there's abstinence and there's recovery, and that's the recovery, and that's how people get well and they're mm. the deal. You're providing the service to, to through the podcast mm. and through the car wash. Yeah, yeah, we were saying that a while ago. Yeah, 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 we were actually talking about that earlier on. Again, the, the another piece of that um, how the academy came about was there was a piece of research done as uh, addiction recovery, a contagious paradigm, um, and then. David Best has wrote, he's a prolific researcher yeah. on the topic of research and he talks about recovery being a contagion of hope and um, that's very much what it is. You, you see, you mentioned fellowship, you mentioned about even being on a podcast speaking like this, people with lived experience saying this is what they've done. It can instill hope in, so, in someone, in many people. Mm -hmm. And But then it's it's about opportunity, like what you've, you've talked about doing, setting up a, a car wash, um, mm -hmm. setting up football games, getting people involved, mm -hmm. a sense of... It, there's a there's an acronym that's used in in the field of mental health and it's chime it's connection hope identity meaning and empowerment mm -hmm. and that's that's what you're trying to create mm -hmm. within the whole recovery movement and that's mm -hmm. what you're you're creating with the people with lived experience mm -hmm. sharing their stories it's like maslow's hierarchy yeah needs, yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah yeah it's the yeah. exact same thing you know once you, you get the food and water you kind of move up your self-esteem yeah. and all these other mm -hmm. things where someone's kind of their self kind of noted in their self yeah. enlightened in recovery then it's yeah. like get rid of yeah. the heroin and the crack and the alcohol and then move on then right this maybe I need, I need a job now because I need to be independent and the education and then the mm. relationships when you're in a good place so everything but that is recovery mm. um, 
what well, one thing I wanted to say to you there, what was it? It's something in my head there now. What was it? But, uh, <laughs> the two boys are good looking. <laughs> no, I, I come back to it. I come back to it. But something I was thinking about there when you were talking was um, I'd love to get part of some sort of like a, a bowling tournament or a pool tournament yeah. or something like that. Because there's a big there's a, there's a big fellowship in Cork. There is, and in Dublin, mm. you know, and it'd be great, you know, to you know, uh, some of the fellowships are very um, they're anonymous. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So by nature. They're not visible. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that's grand if that's what you want to do. Mm. And I was part of that for a long time. Mm. And occasionally, do you know, that's that's great. But what we're trying to do is become more visible. Oh, yeah. What I was thinking of was, so on that point, while I'm on it, right, it's about, you know, having fun activities that are visible, that yeah. you're not, yeah, we are in recovery. You know, we're not ashamed of it. You yeah. know, yeah, we've done bad things, but give us a fucking break. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and showing people that, Look at the crack the boys are having. Yeah, I'm in the depths of it here. Yeah. You could be in the depths of it. You could come down and join in that game of pool. Mm. You could t- mm. I on. suppose, you know, and with, with, with recovery month being September, I love fucking September mm. because it's to show and make recovery visible. So You only love September because the six kids goes to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that, there's that as well. <laughs> but it's, it's about highlighting it and setting up these initiatives. So it's this year because... Covid um, has slowed down and we can actually go out. Um, we set up pop up cafes. So in Cork, we held the first one in the Garden Cafe right. last month. So we've three now next week. We'd one last week. Um, it's May- what's the ones next week? So next week the one is Monday night after the game of ball up in Saint Vincent's GA. Um, from six to half past eight, there's a mobile coffee truck going to go up. We're going to have lights. We're going to have banners with pop up cafe okay. on it. And we we'll be there. I'll be mm-hmm. there. On, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, 100%. Nice one. Yeah. Um, the next one is on Tuesday. So I'm, I'm carving. We have a podcast, actually. On Monday. You yeah. can do it up outside it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, anyway. Um, The next one is on tu- uh, Tuesday in Tralee. So I broke around with Kerry. I'm one person, so it took me a while to break around with Kerry this yeah. year. But Tralee have agreed to light up prominent buildings as well and to have a pop-up cafe um, down in Shan- Shan- um, and the final one then is in for my cool mind information night we're going to have a pop up there oh, um, in the community centre on Wednesday from 2 to 4 that's great um, stuff all a part of the mm. Leave a Light on campaign which I've been driving around most nights lighting up recovery academy members houses um, services cool mind hubs um, Chuck Fair is going to do this uh, Besborough Centre all these places within the community that have agreed to for me to shine lights on their building purple um, mm. to highlight and, and challenge the stigma that's behind addiction yeah. um, and collaboration piece with the City Hall as well. We've got the City Hall, um, the County Hall and the Shaky Bridge lit up purple on the 30th for international I'd be recovery. disappointed if you don't get the reservoir lit up in Ocknihini. I, I was in the I saw it there last week. Was the, it yeah, was, there was something lit up for yeah. the car game, wasn't do, it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the car game. game. The if they can night up for the car game, they can night up I, I went up and mean, said that we I went drove the up, I was yeah. showing it to him a while ago and I said I'd love to get it now That's next year. That's our logo. Yeah. yeah, no, I seen yes, that. Yeah, I seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, something, the, the, the thing I forgot that I wanted to ask you was would I be right in saying that it's the Recovery Academy? It's not just for people in recovery, it can be for people with an interest in it, our family members. Is that fair enough? The walks, the events, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. It's anyone yeah. who's, I suppose, allies and supporters of the recovery movement, mm-hmm. whether it's their, their family, friends that are in recovery and they just want it to show an element of support, you mm-hmm. know. Sure, we all know addiction affects every flipping family member. Do yeah. you know what I mean? So it's for everyone. I'm all inclusive yeah but where we've a lot of people that watch this podcast they have no family member in recovery themselves but they have an interest in it they have an interest in drugs they have an interest in how people end up in it and how they change the lives around you know so they're great allies to have yeah, you know what I mean? yeah because yeah. it just means that we have a wider audience you know or a yeah. wider not audience but a wider family yeah. you know we can cast in that wider so all as well yeah definitely yeah sounds great but well it, done, lads. if we can help you out in any way yeah. Let us know. We're pulling in the same mm. direction. You know what yeah, I mean? We're yeah. all like it's um, as Joanna said to us last week. It's always recovery month in the Tonari's house. You know, <laughs> we shine the light but all that, the time. We keep it always on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like these pop ups aren't just going to be for recovery month. I'm going yeah. to host them throughout the winter, and I'm looking for initiatives to do. Mm. Okay, the soccer I could do up until a certain time, or maybe the weather and stuff like that. But the the pool, the bowling. 
the the pop up cafes like this is going to happen going forward. It's yeah. it's what's going Should to be normal. Should do a bit of mountain climbing as well. Yeah, not yeah. that fit. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get you into hill walking, yeah. hill walking, and then. Do you we'll mind if I bring the four kids? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Two you're tandems. Right. <laughs> you you wear kids. Don't be lying. <laughs> have one in each one. I've enough. I've enough. No, <laughs> with the three year old, that was struggled. The other three would fly up it. Uh, um, Jesus Christ! But yeah, the hill walking is a massive thing for because you know when you walk in hills or mountains or whatever. You might have a crew of 15, 20, but you'll get an opportunity to speak to every single one of them mm. over the four or five hours because people drift, people walk forward, yeah. and you're listening to people's stories. You could be talking to somebody you never met before, and you could be listening to their story, and you might be mm. blown away. You know, So I think that's a great idea as well as maybe introduce a bit of hill walking, and we, we do quite a bit of it with, with, with our own kind of yeah. local lads and stuff like that, and yeah, I see, I see it on social media, yeah. 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 But um, it's a pleasure talking to you, that's... Mm. No, son. Well, thanks for having thanks us. For yeah, having just we, could, we could plug the 30th of September and ask yeah. people, you mentioned families, or yeah. family members or allies, if they can light up their house and post it on social media and yeah. just get the message out. Yeah. Purple, as possible. purple. Yeah. Purple, it's then hashtag leave a light on campaign. So it's the 30th of September. It's International September. Recovery okay. Day, yeah. So I'm highlighting buildings all of Recovery Month because mm-hmm. I like to celebrate it in style. Yeah. We'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to do something decent for that yeah. day as well. Yeah, so if I put cool a if purple, purple cloth or something over my lights, there's a t-shirt yeah. there. Well, health we'll and safety we'll now, yeah. I actually you know, have yeah. spotlights in the booth. I got funding from yeah. off Joe Kirby this yeah. year. So I, I have three spotlights. Yeah. Um, you've seen them, have you? Mm. They have 57 different colours, but they have purple. They're like, yeah. they hurt your eyes if you look at them. Yeah. Um, so I can shine, line up, uh, sh- uh, light up your house or the two naris if you get your new building. Yeah. Sh- yeah. I can light that up as well. Well, I guarantee you this, right? On the 30th, come down to the marina where our new building is. I'll throw that big flag up on the side of the building and you'll shine the light. Nice one. Done deal. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Brilliant. Yeah. All right. See you then. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks. God bless. See you all next week. Hi, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget to head over to the Patreon if you'd like to help us. Thanks again.